you. Happy New Year, Hawkington, and welcome to the January 4th, 2021 school committee meeting. Um, we are meeting remotely, so I need to read this long script. Hang on. As a preliminary matter, this is Amanda Fargiano, Chair of the Hopkinton School Committee. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Okay, we have Meg Tyler. Aye. Joe Markey. Aye. Leah Batley Rafferty. Aye. Nancy Cavanaugh. Aye. And staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Carol Cavanaugh. Yes. Jen Parson. Yes. Susan Rothermick. Yes. Okay. I don't believe we have any guest speakers tonight. Is that correct? Okay. I believe you is correct. Okay. Um, this open meeting of the school committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Uh, ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment as stipulated in our um, agenda, we have received three public comments, which we will get to shortly. For this meeting, the school committee is convening via Zoom video conference as posted on the town's website, and the public may join by watching many different channels of HCAM, either YouTube, HCAM um, Facebook Live, and the HCAM cable TV stations. This um, meeting is also being recorded and can be viewed later. Please note the meeting is being recorded. Some attendees are participating via, via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other members may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting supporting materials have been provided to members of this body and are available on the town's website via the web meeting calendar, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless I note otherwise. Meeting ground rules. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I'll, give, I'll invite board members to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate, accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, and that's it. I think that now uh, turns us to the first item on the agenda. And to those watching, I do apologize. We had an executive session just prior to this. It ran a little bit late. Um, for anyone who is willing and able, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Do we have any recognitions tonight? I would like to, once again, I know I do this frequently, but I would like to recognize um, the nurses and Sean McAuliffe. I can tell you that almost every day this week I was talking with Kathy Bain, and every day this week I was talking with Sean McAuliffe. Um, they held a Zoom session yesterday morning for over an hour to prepare for back to school today. And then when we had some COVID positive cases last night, they were working from probably five to nine last night. So they have been working nonstop throughout this vacation. So I do want to recognize our school nurses and Sean. So we really, really, really appreciate the ability to open our doors today. And it would not be possible without that work. So it, it was a huge gift to the entire community that they put that time in on a holiday weekend. Yes. Yes. Anybody, anybody else? Okay. 
Um, public comment. We have, like I said, I think we received three public comments. Nancy, are you in a position to share those, or do you? I am in a position. Excellent. So the first public comment I have uh, here that we received is from Alana Eagley. And Alana writes, looking ahead at the school calendar, it appears the schools have a half day off every single Friday in January. Additionally, it appears February break remains intact for the year and that even the Friday before February break is off. Have there been any discussions around eliminating some of these breaks to try to invest additional time into a student's formal education? If there was, can you share why the decision was made to not reduce these, these breaks further in efforts to try to keep the students from falling further behind? And that is again from Alana Eagley. The next public comment uh, that we had was from Elizabeth Kiris and she writes, hello, I have a comment and a question that I would like addressed at tonight's school committee meeting. This is for public comment. My name is Elizabeth Kiris and I live in Hopkinton, Mass and have children at Marathon and Elmwood schools. My question is regarding the email that came out today regarding deciding on the remote or in-person track for the remainder of the year. My children are currently attending school in person in the hybrid model. I think that is only fair that we better understand what the full in-person model will entail before deciding whether we feel safe sending our children to attend this model. I am grateful for the in-person instruction and think my children would benefit from increased in-person instruction from an educational standpoint. However, I am also aware that illnesses such as the flu, common cold, and stomach bugs typically spread readily in schools. This year, I believe due to the restrictions in place, my children have not even come home with a cold and we have thus far avoided COVID infection as well, despite an exposure in one of my son's classes. While I hope that I will feel that the parameters surrounding a proposed full in-person return to school are just as safe as the current hybrid model, with cases currently at a peak in town and in the state slash country and a new, newly identified more infectious COVID strain identified, I hope that the safety of the students, staff, and their families will continue to be placed at the highest priority. Can you please comment on why you feel that it is appropriate that parents should be ready to commit to a potential full in-person model this week without having any information available as to what this model may look like? Thank you, Elizabeth Kiris. And the final comment, uh, final public comment that we received is from Mary Schofield, and she writes, I'd like to request the school committee considering, consider adding to a near future agenda the, the discussion of offering in-person extracurricular activities, such as clubs, acting, spring golf, et cetera, at the middle and high school level. If middle school and high school children are allowed to participate in in-person sports with masks on, they should also be offered the opportunity to participate in school affiliated clubs and after school activities. Offering these over Zoom does not provide the same benefit as these in-person experiences do. I would appreciate the school committee working towards a solution to offer in-person social development opportunities, not just to athletes, but that could be of interest to all students. At the very least, if basketball is allowed, middle school golf should be offered this spring. Thank you. So, and that's it for public comments that I saw. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, well, we can't, deliberator comment on public comments, I can turn it over to the next agenda, which is the superintendent's report, which may touch on some of the public comment uh, subject matter. So Dr. Kavanaugh, superintendent's report. I will just take the screen. Oops. Georgette, you're going to need to give me access to the screen, please. Oop, got it. Thank you. All right, so Happy New Year to everyone. Uh, hoping that 2021 uh, brings us greater joys, the ones that we may have missed in 2020. Uh, this is the superintendent's report for Monday evening, January 4th, 2021. 
Um, it's a, a pretty brief report tonight. I did want to touch on um, very briefly, take a look at the FY22 budget recap. And just as a reminder, next week on Monday, we do have our FY22 budget hearing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what that budget looks like tonight, just so people have um, a sense of, of where it's going next week. And obviously we will do a full budget presentation for folks next week as well. Uh, we had three uncertainties as we were building the budget, and I know that we've seen this slide many times along the way. Um, the first one is enrollment. So the budget that is built right here is the one that we have planned based on the students who are in front of us. Typically, I tell you a little bit about enrollment. We are um, up nine students since the last time I have made a presentation on that. And we really are uncertain whether our kids will be returning to us if they've left to go off to you know, private schools, parochial schools, homeschooling, those kinds of things. But we may have much larger classes than anticipated next year. So enrollment remains somewhat of a little bit of a mystery to us. Uh, we are also worried about PPE. Uh, we right now have $187,000 in the budget for consumable PPE, paper towels, hand sanitizer, masks, those kinds of items. We don't know the degree to which we will need those and whether we would have to spend $187,000, $87,000, nothing at all. It would be would be difficult for us to say at this point in time. And then of course, is contract negotiations. We will be entering into negotiations with three different bargaining units, the Hopkins and Teachers Association, the paraprofessionals and the school nurses. So those are our variables, three uncertainties, and we have built a budget that looks like this. So I've really just stolen Mrs. Rothermick's slides. And um, if I stop for a moment, you can jump in and, and assist me at some point. Um, but our total operating budget for FY 2021 is $51,206,402. And so what we are looking at in FY 22 is a salary increase of $2,145,327, which is a 4.2% increase over the previous year, and then a FY22 expense increase of $802,182, an increase of 1.6%. So the overall increase um, from FY21 to FY22 is 5.8%. The dollar amount on that is $2,947,509, bringing the FY22 operating budget to 54 million $153,911. Um, just taking a very quick look at how we get the $802,000 for expenses. Um, some of those things are contractual. Some of them are you know, just due to inflation. Um, some of them are current services. So for example, um, if we are thinking about transportation costs, when we have um, you know, additional uh, transportation for, you know, special education or something along those lines, you know, that's how that ends up in their central office, an increase of $66,000 perhaps for, you know, legal fees. Um, so you can see we have student services, instructional costs, um, nothing under the category of instructional program enhancements, and then admin support and facility enhancements. Uh, so all of those things have been outlined previously and they will be again next week. Um, for our salary re requests for student services, we have a half of an FTE for a teaching position, 4.1 FTE paraprofessionals, a full BCBA, 0.4 occupational therapy, uh, 1.2 increase in nursing, and 0.2 support. So that would be sort of an administrative position, administrative assistant position increase to someone who's already here. Um, in terms of instructional costs and enrollment growth, we are looking at 2.4 FTEs at the Elmwood School, 1.0 FTE each at the middle school and the high school, and um, we also need an additional ESOL teacher, so that's a teacher to help our students who need to learn English as they arrive in the Hopkinton Public Schools. Our instructional program enhancements, uh, Elmwood needs a 1.0 FTE adjustment counselor, and we are looking to hire a 0.6 FTE math coach. Um, it's our belief that coming out of the pandemic, we are probably going to need someone to um, take a really good look at any potential learning gaps, where our kids are, and how to kind of accelerate curriculum if we can, um, how to bolster curriculum to ensure that kids um, get what they need. 
And then finally, um, administrative support and facility enhancement positions. We've got a 1.0 FTE for technology, custodial, admin support, um, pairs, and then a 0.2 HR position. So altogether, that's 18.6 FTEs totaling $959,000. $265. Um, we are hoping that people will tune in next Monday on January 11th, 2021 for the FY22 budget hearing. This is the community's opportunity to really um, interact with the school department and the school committee relative to that budget. All right, oops, I clearly missed a slide. There we go. Um, finally, we have some important information about things that are happening in the district, and this may be helpful to one of the people who has written in to ask about um, families who wish to, wish to transition from hybrid to remote or remote to hybrid. So we are asking families to fill that information out right now. And we're asking them to do that because we're midway through the year. And so it's very logical, we think, if you're you know, a high school student to make that jump at the semester break. At the middle school, it will be on February 3rd because that's when we start the new related arts courses at the middle school. And so um, just in keeping with the other two schools, the elementaries will make that transition on February 1st as well. I know it's difficult for parents to make that decision today. And if parents are wondering about what that will, will look like if we start to reopen you know, our doors in the spring, um, I, they can certainly call the central office and I'm happy to have a conversation with any one of them. But safety will always be paramount in any decision that the school department makes. We will always think about the safety of our students. Uh, we will be looking at, you know, not only the trajectory of the virus at that point in time, I know it's hard for people right now to be thinking, you know, what is the virus going to look like, especially when you were in this moment of, you know, of just peak virus. I mean, it's just, you know, the numbers are outrageous. We've had several days in a row of being over 6,500 new cases in Massachusetts. Um, but we will also have um, hopefully the benefit of immunization for all of our faculty and staff um, coming up in the spring. So those are, are two things that we will really think hard about. Um, obviously, we are still gonna be thinking about things like wearing masks and washing our hands and using hand sanitizer and practicing social distancing and the things that have kept us safe to date. Um, I will say that I, I usually like to um, include as part of my report that we've had no in-school transmission. We still have had no student-to-student -student transmission of the virus, but we actually have had uh, one faculty member transmit the virus to another. Um, and in that situation, uh, the, you know, the adults were, were not wearing masks. So it's just important to, to have a sense of, of you know, perhaps why that did happen. But I don't want to be disingenuous with the community and say that we've had no in-school school transmission of the virus. Um, at this point, we, we indeed have. Um, the second thing that's important for parents to know is that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has new mandates. And what they are asking of Hopkinton in particular is to ensure that on students' asynchronous days, there is some kind of contact for all students. So something like simple office hours won't do. We have to have something where students are checking in with their teachers. And that could be as simple as morning meeting. It could be a shared read aloud. It could be... Um, a, an additional set, session of related arts during the day. Um, it could be something that happens at the middle school during Hiller Block. So we have spent this past week, um, Jennifer Parson and I, the assistant superintendent, meeting with all of the principals and trying to think about what that would look like within the constraints of the budget. I know parents have asked about this topic as well when they're thinking about the transition, but what Hopkinton's been asked to do is to add roughly 45 minutes to an hour of asynchronous, of in-person of in learning time on the asynchronous days for our students. So if you're making a decision based on that, please don't think that you're going to have six and a half hours of traditional instruction during the day because that's not what, what we're being asked to do by DESE. We are being asked to ensure that we have 35 hours of instruction uh, over a 10-day period. And then today, number three, we did have our full-time reopening team survey go out. It went out to both teachers and parents today. Uh, parents who are paying attention at home, please note that we are inviting two parents to serve on that team. 
Um, I know people are have also asked questions about sort of time on learning, which is kind of a nice fit, I think, with these three topics right here. Um, when we think about time on learning, you know, we, we obviously follow DESE's mandates, but our teacher contract says that our teachers would be working for 183 days. And so each day that our teachers all come to work costs the district about $167,000 per day. So if we were to say, well, let's just add days to the calendar, which was one of the suggestions that Desi made, if you didn't want to add asynchronous time, you could compensate for it by adding days to the calendar. There's no way that Hopkinton can afford to continue to add increments of 167,000. So even if you say I'm going to eliminate February vacation, you would have to then reduce and teachers taught through it and you'd have to get approval from the teachers association obviously you'd then be eliminating those days at the end of the school year so we would not be adding additional time to students instruction based on days you know so if we are making contact with kids on asynchronous days that will add to instructional time but we can't simply erase vacation time um, or erase half days because that would come with a cost to the district. And just so we know, those half days are typically put in there for teachers to um, have, you know, things like conferences with parents. So that's why we build them in and they are also contractual. And that is all I have for you. So I will take us back to our oops, visual there. And I'm happy to take questions and then hand the screen over. Anyone have any questions or comments for Dr. Kavanaugh? I have a I have a comment, and it's the last slide, Carol, that you had up there. Okay, I can go back to that. Just, um, yeah, yes. The comment is just that I look at a slide like this, and each one of these boxes. I know represents a lot of work that the administration is doing. We have, and then the, the entire support network, the guidance counselors, the um, people who do our schedules in our technology department, people who do, um, you know, manage student records and whatever. Every time we look at one of these boxes, whether it's bringing in people who were remote and now they want to be in hybrid, or the second box, you know, we take DESI mandates that came out not in August or July, but in December, and we have to quickly implement something by January 19th. Um, you know, and then we, you know, we as a district and as a committee want to pr prepare for a time when we can have all of our students together in the buildings. Every one of these boxes I know is a huge amount of scheduling, budget management, staffing, Etc. And I just want to say that I really appreciate the work that's going on. And I, I know this is on top of, in a normal year, all of our administrators are already fully busy. They're occupied. These are full-time jobs that happen, you know, on an ongoing basis. And in this particular year, on top of the ongoing job of an administrator, we have added this and managing the COVID cases and the contact tracing and do we quarantine and do we open, do we close? And it, it, it is a lot. It's a lot to look at from the outside, so I'm sure it's a lot on the inside, and I just want to say thank you to you and the administrative team and everybody who supports you um, pulling reports and schedules and so forth. So, Well, thank you. I, I do think that you know when we have principals meetings or administrative meetings and we bring these topics up, you can see on people's faces just how hard the work really is. I know that as parents, are at home and you might think it's very easy to take your kiddo who has been you know having online learning and just move them into a hybrid model um it feels really easy but we have to remember that that child has been in the same classroom with like 25 peers all year and then if you move that child into a classroom where the teacher doesn't know him none of the peers are familiar with that with that particular child it's kind of jarring for the child but it's also one of those things where the teacher says now i have to you know, we spend a lot of time at the beginning of the school year trying to understand the learning profile of a kid. So when you make that move in the middle of the year, what we're saying is now you have to relearn that that learning profile. And sometimes people are asking to go from hybrid out to remote and those classes are already at 25. So now they bump to 26 or 27. So we just really need to be, be careful. So I appreciate your comments, Amanda, very much because it, these are really tricky situations. And when you put them out on a slide like this, they don't feel nearly as tricky as they really are for all of our personnel. So thank you. 
Anybody else? Or we're we moving on. Okay. Uh, so thank you for that. So I think we're moving on to the chair report, and I'm saving you all my very light slides that I usually have. I, you know, I didn't get to them over the holiday, and there really wasn't a lot to report because we've met so frequently. Um, I, I will. Want, I do want to share with the committee that I will be working in January on our um, report to submit for the annual report for the town for annual town meeting. So, um, just as sort of a heads up that I got prompted for that, I will put together some preliminary thoughts and at our next meeting um, share them with you so that we can start to build a narrative that represents the work that we've done for the last 12 months. Um, other than that, I have approved warrants 21041, 21042, 21043, and 21044, which are included in the packet, and payroll warrant S21013. And um, beyond that, it's, it was kind of quiet for me, anyway, over the holidays. So, <laughs> um, that's all I have. Liaison reports. Again, it's been vacation, so. Um, and office hours, uh, we will schedule offline. I don't have a date yet for our next ones. New business. We have the Hopkins gift account, Dr. Kavanaugh. Uh, yes. So I am requesting that the school committee accept a don donation from the Bedrosian family of $40 in lieu of the Meadow Farms fundraiser. So instead of participating, they would prefer just to donate the $40. So moved. Second. Motion by Nancy. I'll take a second by Leah. I'll give you the tie. Um, I, need a, I think I need a roll call vote since we're remote. So Nancy? Yes. Meg? Aye. Joe? Aye. Leah? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. And thank you very much for that donation. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, the trombone don donation. Yes. We also have a donation. Um, this is coming to Mr. Hay um, from the Rhodes family for a Holton Collegiate trombone to be used in our school music program. Um, those of you who have purchased uh, musical instruments for your children, you know how expensive they can be. So these donations are wonderful for you know some of our kids who um, would like to be able to play these musical instruments in school and the school district only buys a few of them for some of our kids. So to have as many as possible on hand is really, really helpful. So I'm asking that you accept this trombone donation from the Rhodes family. So moved. Okay, motion by Meg to accept. Second. Second by Leah. Um, my only point of discussion, I should say, is that I think I know the musician who used this Rhodes instrument, and I have fond memories of hearing it played. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so all those in five, so we need, sorry, I need to do roll call vote. Nancy. Yes. Meg. Yes. Leah. Yes. Joe. Aye. And I'm I as well, and thank you for the trombone. I'm sure it will get put to good use. Um, more donations. Dr. Kavanaugh from the Loiters Environmental. Yes, Loiters Environmental. They would like to donate $100 to the Hopkinton Public Schools, and we are looking for you to accept that $100 donation. I'm curious, do they have a targeted use? Um, I can go in and take a look at it, but I read it earlier this morning, and I don't think that I know. Just in appreciation of the many clients who are privileged to service in Hopkinton, we're pleased to make a donation to the school department. No targeted use. Lovely. Hmm. Please move the ones in any way you consider appropriate is the last line. Lovely. Yes. So we have a motion by Leah to accept. Anybody want a second? A second. Second by Nancy. I'll do a roll call vote. Nancy? Yes. Meg? Yes. <laughs> Joe? Aye. Leah? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to item D, the reopening advisory group. Um, so as Dr. Kavanaugh has mentioned, there will be a reopening advisory group, and we need to designate one of the five of us to serve on said group as a of school committee. Um, I imagine almost all of us are interested, but I would like to hear from anybody who is interested in putting their name in the in the hat, and then we will we'll vote. Is anyone interested in serving on this committee? 
it will mean um, meetings. And for me, the important part of the representative from school committee is that obviously you participate fully, but also that you bring the information back to school committee so that when we hear about the happenings, we hear from Dr. Kavanaugh, but we also hear from the designee as a participant. It's nice to get the full picture. So anybody who's interested, I would, I would encourage um, good communication back at our meetings when we do um, liaison reports and so forth. Well, I would be glad to participate. Um, I think that my experience this summer gave me some insight into such a process, but if you think that you need um, fresh insight, someone else can absolutely participate. Thank you, Meg. Is anyone else interested? I guess maybe I thought everybody would be interested. <laughs> I, I, I am. I, I I would be interested if there was not somebody, but I do think Meg would do an excellent job. Um, and I would not want to, I think your history over the summer and kind of looking at how we built what we built as well as, you know, your, your active participation in other groups in town uh, gives you a good lens to be able to bring the voice back and forth. So I would support that. I'm interested in Meg Tyler being the school committee <laughs> Joe got a sneak peek at the meeting schedule. No. <laughs> no, I have to agree. I think uh, Meg's consideration for a lot of kids who have, you know, special needs or who may not be fully served at all times will allow her to really contribute and to bring back some really interesting insight along with Dr. Kavanaugh. Well, this is easy peasy. Meg, I think if you're willing, um, I'm going to... I'm going to entertain an official motion to make you our designee. Hey, it would be my honor. I need a motion. I would, I would move that we appoint Meg Tyler to be our representative on, um, there's probably an official wording to this in the, I move to approve one school committee member, Meg Tyler, to the reopening advisory group. Thank you. Motion by Nancy, I think it was a second by Leah. Um, yeah. And how do you vote, Nancy? Yes. Meg? I guess so. Yes. <laughs> uh, Joe? Aye. Leah? Aye. And I'm Anai as well. Meg, thank you so much for serving on this. I think your um, experience in the fall will be helpful to inform your participation. It'll be great to have you. So, All right. There you go, Dr. Kavanaugh. Meg Tyler. Thank you. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Seamless, Meg. Seamless. Um, old business. We have the HCA funds discussion for town warrant. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. So we have had conversations about, you know, kind of the, I guess, tenuousness of going into this budget season. Um, we could be spot on with our budgeting right now, or we could be off, whether it, we're talking about, you know, the, need, the enrollment that just kind of goes through the roof. Um, and I have long been worried about that. And so one of the things that we've talked about sort of to kind of cover us, and I think that this falls nicely under the, the purposefulness of the uh, Legacy Farms Host Community Agreement, was to set aside a little bit of money asking town meeting to uh, appropriate some of that to the school committee, hand it over to you for your use in the event that we have um, enrollment that requires the hiring of additional staff. You know, as I was just presenting some of the highlight slides of the budget, you can see that the, you know, the salaries in, in our district for all of our bargaining units make up about 80% of the, of the budget and, you know, expenses make up about 20%. So we have to come up with that that dollar amount that would say this would be you know a, a recommended amount of money you know for you to decide upon to kind of cover us in the event that we need some patchwork in the FY22 budget. Now, if that turns out to be the case, we have to remember that the people that we are hiring would become sort of foundational as we move into the FY23. So this is not ideal budgeting, but it does get us from point A to point B in the event that that we need it. And I would invite any um, conversation too from Mrs. Rothmick, who clearly has been, you know, far more invested, I think, in this budgeting process, you know, from like a 
that sort of nickel and dime kind of right down to the nitty gritty look at it. So, yeah, and I know there was a question um, of what the balance was in the fund. So, in in checking the payments that have been received, it's a little over two million. So, two million and ninety seven has been received. Another two million will be due um, during the FY twenty one. Uh, so that would bring the account up to about four million. Okay, members, do you have questions or comments? Thank you, Ms. Rothermick, but that's definitely what, one thing we asked last time for the balances. Since I haven't been here <laughs> and uh, I've been focused on other things, just, just a very quick question. Is this uh, a warrant where no matter what we expect to move the funds or is this a warrant where it's sort of a contingency item and when the town meeting comes around if you know if we find that we're in a good place and we don't need it we'll just tell them to vote it down or it like how what's the thought process behind this particular item well i think uh the way it's worded is that the money is received into the town uh it, the town it needs to be allocated at town meeting to our, um, oh my gosh, what is the word? What fund is that? Stabilization. Our, thank you. Our stabilization fund, at which point we have, we, it is under our control to spend or not spend. It can sit there in our okay. stabilization fund. Um, just, you know, but if we don't allocate it at town meeting, then we school committee can't access it. So if we think we're okay in September and January comes around and we realize we're in a panic, the only way that we could get at it would be to have a special town meeting that would then, um, with a warrant article that would then um, ask for that to be allocated to us. And allocation does not mean that we're spending it. It just means that it puts it under the purview and control of the school committee. Okay, thank you. And if town meeting is in May, this does need to go, you know, as an article on the warrant now. Yeah. Joe, did you want to? Yeah, no, I think it makes sense to, to put it over to, to put the warrant forward so we have this in our stabilization fund on the school side in case we need it. And I'm sure that uh, Mrs. Rothermish is, it would be very judicious in recommending whether or not to use it. At one point, um, it, it, I guess over the last year, this, this funding source kind of changed a little and now there's a cap on it. Well, we'll be getting two million more this year, as Ms. Rothman mentioned. Uh, that's it. There's a cap. Whereas it used to be that for every cohort of 40 students um, that are added to the population at Legacy Farms, the host community agreement was required the developer to pay a certain amount every time that happened. Now, into the future, forever, if another 40 students are added 10 years from now, that cap is set. So we have to be very judicious on how we use this money because while the demand uh, on population growth there may continue for many years, the funding source is now capped. So again, I, I think it makes sense to bring it over uh, into the stabilization on the school side, but then be very judicious on making sure we save it uh, for when really needed based on enrollment growth there. Dr. Kavanaugh, what is the current amount that you and Ms. Rothermick have come up with as a recommendation for us to ask for? So, and you know that one of the things that I'm always saying is that every every 20 students will equate to about 1.4 um, teachers in terms of what we would need. So imagine we get 100 students more than we had anticipated, which really could happen. I mean, that's, you know, that's not fabricated at all. There, there's a, a strong likelihood that something like that could happen. So that would mean that we would have five groups of, of 20. Um, one of the things is, which is, when we think about it, that's about seven teachers then, because you're going to take your five groups of 20, five times the 1.4 and get to seven. So if you needed seven additional teachers, and what we will typically do when we hire is we and I guess it's just kind of happened this way that we bring in candidates who are in that like master's step five-ish category. We are a very fortunate di district that we are able to actually hire people 
who have years of experience and a master's degree. You know, there's some districts that are always hiring at BA step one. We pay a little more, but we get that expertise, which is nice. So if we needed those seven teachers and we were looking at the dollar amount that's somewhere around master's step five, we're talking about $70,000. So seven teachers times the $70,000 would bring us to 490,000 or rounded up 500,000. Um, you know, I don't, there wasn't actually a motion, I don't think, written on the agenda, but I'm hoping that we can make one since the topic was there. So, um, I know that there's a deadline. When is the deadline for submitting this amount for the warrant? I want to say that it's, it's at the end of the month. You know that answer, Susan. Yeah, don't. it's towards the end of January. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but I've already given I've already given the um, financial team a heads up that we would be looking for around five hundred thousand. So, that, you know, they already have that in their mind in terms of looking at the total funding scenario for the budget. Yeah. Um, so that that number is is in their mind. Okay. So, do we have to vote it tonight, or? Um, I mean, it just that it's not written on the agenda. I see there's no motion there. Or can we wait? I mean, we have the placeholder there. Um, I don't know that the committee has any additional discussion. It sounds like there's general support for making this accessible to the committee for the emergency that might come up next year. So how would you like to proceed, Dr. Kavanaugh? So we have a budget hearing next Monday on the 11th, and then we have another formal meeting on the... 19th on that Tuesday after Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So that does give you a little bit of time. Okay. So let's vote it um, on the 19th just to make sure that we've done it properly with uh, open meeting law and so forth. And, um, you know, I I don't have a, you know, it's, hard, it's hard to assess. The 500,000 seems reasonable. Um, in, in, we would need to use this money for things related to growth. So, um, I mean, it seems reasonable. I, I, we really have to defer to you and Ms. Rodemick to figure out if you, um, between now and the 19th, if you have any hesitation about the amount as you look at the budget. So we have to vote the warrant, at, like, so the writing of the warrant as opposed to the, are we going to have a warrant piece? So, like, on the 19th, are we voting on some some wording? Or are we just voting to go ahead and do it? Because it seems like a very short amount of time to to give somebody to write a warrant article and uh, maybe review it a few times. I don't know. I don't know how the process works from the school committee side. I don't believe you voted on the actual language before, but. OK. No, it, the, the language is. The language is actually reviewed by the town's legal counsel. Um, okay. So because we have already done this once before at another town meeting where we allocated some money over, we're basically using that same language that has already gone through legal review. Oh, okay, perfect. And we're not tying it to a specific initiative. It's We're allocating it to the school's discretion to the stabilization fund. So it's right. not targeted. We don't have to spend it on a specific. Can I ask you, I have a question just related to the amount. I am thinking back to last year when we met as a joint meeting with the uh, select board and I think appropriations was there as well. And it at that time, in order for us to move the budget forward as we felt we needed to to support our district this year, it was requested that we use money to balance from the stabilization fund to balance out our budget. There was a certain amount that, and in the end, we didn't end up, the town didn't end up needing us to do that. But is there any indication at this point in the discussion that that could happen again? Because my concern would be if we're holding this money and transferring it to the stabilization fund for unforeseen circumstances, if there, a chunk of that money is gone off the bat, we then have less for something that could come up down the road. That's my only hesitation. Otherwise, I'm comfortable with the amount. Yeah, I had that same question. And I think um, at this point, 
we believe our budget, we haven't been told that there's a funding um, equation that includes HCA money to meet our budget. Right, Dr. Kavanaugh, you haven't, you haven't heard that. No, we have not been asked to use HCA money at all to meet the requirements of this budget. Thank you. Last year, I think it was close to 800,000. It was looking really bleak with um, state funding and so forth. If well, the uh, budget ask was also what we needed not, last year was significantly more as a percentage. So the, the committee should also still keep in mind that while we are have progressed along in in the budget, um, the town still has a ways to go, it, which would include the funding. Um, so it is still early on in the budget process, and the, you know the funding case, if you will, still needs to be figured out. I guess a follow-on question to that. Given the way this money was defined in the um, in the host community agreement, I know there may have been sort of a different um, exception during COVID, during the pandemic for stabilization funds and how they could be utilized. Does that hold true in non-pandemic times, or in non-pandemic times, does this revert back to? Um, money that can only be spent at the discretion of the school committee? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. I think that might be a question for our legal counsel. Okay. I don't know that that article continued forward okay. beyond um, that initial year. Okay. So somewhere between now and and the, uh, the town meeting, I guess, we would have to have a conversation again, to Nancy's point, with the select board and appropriations where we agree to um, look at that fund if it's asked of us. And then at that point, I would imagine we could discuss the amount that we need for unforeseen circumstances if our balance is $2 million right now. And we're looking at 500 I guess we would look at it at the time that it comes forward. But it really, I mean, with the growth that we're predict predicting, and to Joe's point, the fact that there's a cap right now that there wasn't originally, we have to be very judicious about how we spend this money. So those will be tough conversations. Hopefully it won't come to that. I think our asks this year are very reasonable. Our, our um, incremental headcount has been extremely conservative um, compared to previous years. So hopefully um, it'll all even out in the end. Agree. Okay, anything else or moving on? Future agenda items. Does anyone have a future agenda item? I was actually wondering, Dr. Kavanaugh, if you thought we might be able to get an update at some point on extracurriculars um, to, the, uh, to the point of the person who wrote in tonight. I don't have a sense personally of how things are going, which ones are running, which ones are running remotely, and are kids participating? Just sort of some general overview. Yes, I think we had this conversation um, sort of offline at one point. I did reach out to Mr. Bishop and Mr. Keller to ask that question, and most of our clubs are in fact running. I mean, if they're not running, it's because you know, there wasn't student interest or there wasn't an advisor, um, but they are mostly uh, remote at this point, and I think that the teachers who are the advisors to them are you know, pretty much telling us that, that they work well enough, you know, to offering them remotely. And then you can have unlimited numbers of kids. You know, like once you get above 12, you would have to say, we can't have that club because that's how many kids will fit in, you know, the, the classroom. Or if it's a little bit larger club, maybe they could move into, you know, the gym and occupy some of the desks where kids eat lunch but you know it does get it gets unwieldy I think when when you get too too many of them so you know that is a conversation I think to have with the building principals to see how they would feel about having some of those clubs in person and certainly to have with the advisors as well great so if there's an update we'll just you know you can tell us at what meeting that would work if there's a, in maybe a participation are kids zoomed out or are they actually participating Do, you know it's it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? Okay. 
Items by consensus, Dr. Cavanaugh. Okay, as superintendent, I recommend that the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Meg, second by Leah, and a thank you to Nancy for all those meeting minutes. <laughs> That, uh, thank you to Georgette. I just, she, the, all the public meeting notes she actually takes, I fill in little things here and there. Well, thank you to Georgette. I know you're listening. Um, okay, so we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Nancy? Yes. Meg? Yes. Joe? Aye. Leah? Aye. And I'm and I as well. Um, and that brings us to adjournment. It's too bad it's not back in the days where we had ice cream available as an option afterwards. <laughs> I think hockey was selling soup now. I saw that. It, I actually, I got some one day. It's very good. <laughs> would anyone like to make a motion to adjourn? Surely. I would like to make that motion. Motion by Meg. Second. Second by Leah. And I'll do a roll call vote, Nancy. Yes. Meg? Yes. Joe? Aye. Leah? Aye. And I'm an I as well. And we are adjourned at 7.59 p.m. New year, new record. We're, above, <laughs> we're ahead of schedule. Okay, we meet next um, on Monday, January 11th. And I really encourage the public to participate. The public hearing, as Dr. Kavanaugh said, is a time for um, live questions and answers. So it will be a webinar format um, on Zoom, and you'll be able to um, turn on your mic and or, or type in the chat and ask questions. So um, as you look through the uh, materials, which we will have out on the website, I believe. They are on the website. And for anyone who would like to visit the central office, you can see a hard copy there. Perfect. Um, yeah, so this is a, a great time for us to hear from the community about any concerns or questions with the budget. Uh, we will vote the budget on January 19th and then uh, meet again on February 4th. So great. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you uh, for participating, Ms. Parson, Ms. Rothermick, and Dr. Kavanaugh. And I'll see you next week. Great. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank night, you, everybody. HKM. <laughs>